that's, that's modified to create an assay for you in what's called a high throughput screen where you screen many millions or billions of small molecules that come from diverse kinds of libraries. Instead, what we've learned in, uh, in the past, I would say, decade, is that it's possible now to look at the development of small molecule probes in a very different way. Um, this is a model at atomic resolution of what's called a, uh, the portion of an acetylase that's bound by an acetylase inhibitor. So this acetylase modifies target proteins by adding an acetyl group on a lysine amino acid that is part of the building block of proteins. And what it's doing is it's simply acting as a competitive inhibitor here. It clogs up that catalytic site and prevents it from acting on its target. And in the case where this acetylase might be an oncogene protein and misacetylating lots of proteins to do the things that cancer cells need to do, this small molecule would prevent that activity. Well, rather than screening millions of compounds in complex robotic situations with highly valuable libraries in the pharmaceutical industry, two types of new approaches to screening, um, three types actually, two new types have been developed. So I just described large library screening, which is not something we want to do. Instead, we want to do either structure-based design or activity-based design. What are these designs? In structure-based design, you can take advantage of the knowledge of the enzymatic activity of a protein and the knowledge of all the drugs that have been developed that fit into those catalytic pockets. And people who are trained to do medicinal chemistry can take this, what are called the scaffolds of those drugs that have been developed previously and modify them in various ways. And so now, rather than screening billions of compounds, you're basically looking at a very small number of small molecules that you can test in an academic laboratory for their relative effectiveness in inhibiting that specific target. The other way you can go about this is activity-based design. Activity-based design um, is related to this in that you may not need to know the structure of the protein that you're inhibiting. You may only need to know that specific activity that it had. And again, you're taking advantage of knowledge of all the kinds of drug chemistries that have been developed before to look at a smaller space. And these smaller spaces can be done in academia. So our intention is to take what you see on the left, a target that may be in the control room of transcriptional control, of gene control in a lung cancer, to take that target to identify either through structure-based design or activity-based design a set of small molecules that we'll call a chemical probe. They are not ready to go into humans. We are not interested in investing in the process by which you do pharmacological modifications so that it would, in the bloodstream of a person, do all the right behaviors. We're interested in it simply inhibiting in our in vitro systems the activity of interest. And to use it then as a probe to further understand the biology and determine whether or not, in a preclinical setting, it may be valued of a further pursue as a real drug target. So that's the approach. We want to take these, these three-legged stools, we're going to take the genetic screens, these genome-wide CRISPR screens that David's been pioneering. We want to take this genomic information, the pathway information that leads us to a deep understanding of exactly what's gone wrong in those cells and why they're vulnerable to these specific essentiality genes. And then we want to take it a step further. We want to work to identify small molecules that will be, we hope then, an accelerator for many other scientists interested in further understanding the biology of those cancers and in developing tools, real drugs, that uh, may have efficacy in patients' tumors. So I just want to review for you the people involved in this. 
because I, I think they're very special. In fact, one of the re remarkable things about Whitehead is that the faculty every year take a retreat together. They take their, their spouses, their kids, their dogs and cats, fish, to, to a retreat for a week, and they work together at, at play, and they work together at thinking about the best ways to make the Institute uh, do everything it can be. So we have a remarkable history of success, partly because of this collaboration among friends. We have students and postdocs who recognize the advantages of working across laboratories, and often they solve problems before we, that we, the faculty, even know they exist. And so it's that, it's that environment, I think, that makes us who we are. And so David, you've seen him, you've, you've heard this introduction. I hope you'll spend a little bit of time talking to him, and, and as he said, we're going to be open for questions in just a moment. I'm very excited about this. You know, I'm sure for each of you, there's been a time in your lives where there was an inflection point. You, you can probably remember it right now, something very special that happened that made you realize that you could make a huge difference that you did not appreciate before. That's what I'm telling you is happening now. Piyush Gupta, our youngest investigator, someone who's really pioneering the uh, solutions, I think, to the st cancer stem cell problem in cancer, the types of cells that may be reluctant to become full cancer cells in, in, while we're drugging uh, these targets, and yet later on may evolve into new tumor cells and be some of the underlying mechanism by which tumors become resistant to cancer. And Bob Weinberg, who you know, um, and as David said, identified the first oncogene and really is, uh, a, it continues to be uh, a leader in the field of cancer. So I hope you come to understand that, that what we're trying to do here is to take these various technologies, bring them together to develop knowledge, not just for us, but actually for everyone in the scientific, pharmacological, clinical community, and to help accelerate solutions to cancer. I, th I think it's a time when we can do this, we must do this, and uh, I think it's a great time for you to help us do it. I think if there's ever a time that you want to have a really a tremendous impact in this type of space, it's now and, and it's with this initiative. So thank you very much. that there are carcinogens in the environment. And I didn't hear anything about the genetic components of the effect of carcinogens. Do you want to do it? <laughs> Either one. So uh, there are carcinogens in the environment. Um, in the cancer space, the, you know, the, the, the most the epidemiological evidence argues that the biggest carcinogen in cancer is cigarette smoke. Um, that that is contributing, uh, among all the con contributors, it is cigarette smoke that makes that has the biggest impact. And you can see that, especially in countries where um, there isn't a broad appreciation for how dangerous it is um, in inducing lung cancer. There are, of course, many other types of carcinogens, things that do DNA damage, and, uh, and that is a consequence induced cancer. When we're thinking about these essentiality genes, uh, we're thinking about uh, genes that often are the genes that help us repair that damage. So they're integral. David, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that. I guess all I would say is that, that um, the carcinogens are the, the way you damage the genes to get the cancer. Uh, our approach, to some extent, is downstream of that. I don't, I don't think we're going to stop that. that. That's, to some extent, a public health uh, issue. 
But the approach doesn't really matter whether the cancer has been driven by a viral infection, which there are you know, a fair number of those, or by a mutation driven by a carcinogen, or simply by, you, know, you probably saw a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, there was sort of the, the bad luck hypothesis of, of cancer where there's a certain rate of mutagenesis simply because no process is perfect. As Rick said, it's, it's hard to believe things work as, they, as well as they do. And so however you get that initiation, to some extent is not relevant here. We're below that. So now that you have that cancer cell, what's driving it? What makes it tick? I think that's what we can identify now. And as Rick outlined, push along that process towards actually making a drug that would target that. Question. Is there evidence that, that we are uh, creating more types of cancer as we go along? Or what you have observed is kind of a static level? And so you've got 10,000 troops out there and you've got to destroy those? Or is that troops that are out there waging battle against you growing every year? Well, I'll tell you how I think about that, and then I'll ask David uh, to, uh, to chime in. It, you know, some cancers look like they're one thing, you know, bur something called Burkitt's lymphoma. It looks like it's a, a clonal consequence of something called a translocation that brings uh, a super enhancer, a, 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 a monster driver of gene expression right up against the MYC gene and overexpresses it, and that's the event you need. But most cancers, when you look at them across a patient population, have a huge distribution of genetic alterations that lead us to believe that if you're diagnosed with a specific type of cancer, it's rarely a single unique genetic abnormality. It is often many things, and your friend may have the same cancer, but it doesn't have to actually be exactly that set of uh, genetic alterations. It can be a complex set, and that's actually why it's so important to get a genome-wide view of everything that's going on in that cancer and why we haven't been able to do that until these new technologies have come along. I don't have too much more to add, but, but as you well appreciate, in the past, most cancer was diagnosed simply morphologically, right? A, a pathologist would look at cells and say it's this type of cancer. And we certainly had fewer types of cancer back then because many things looked alike. Then the genomic era came around and all these cancers were sequenced. And to some extent, people were saying, well, every single cancer is its own type of cancer. That, that's clearly an extreme situation as well. And we're probably somewhere in between there where there are very large numbers of mutations and there, in fact, are many distinct subtypes of cancers, like I mentioned with AML. But yet, as Rick was showing, the mutations all drive pathways that eventually converge on some key processes. And the, really question, the real question is, what are those? Because those are the vulnerabilities that one can go after whether the mutation was driven by cancer X, or, or sorry, mutation Y, or cancer, mutation X, sorry, I got that all backwards. Um, so I think that's really what we're driving at, this sort of functional information that tells us which genes matter independently of how you got there. Whether there's new types of cancers arising, I, I, I don't think there's tremendous evidence for, for that. You know, there, there's probably some, but, but really not. So it's, more, it's more the classifications that are, that are changing. I probably don't know what I'm talking about, but you you um, made a comment about a singling singling pathways research and circulatory pathways research. What are you finding as to each one of these, or are they completely related? Yeah, I know they're related, but what are you learning about that in terms of your own research? So I, I, I'll I'll take that. The um, you know each cell in your body is, knows who its neighbors are. It's really quite sensitive to it. And the reason it knows is because there are receptors on the surface that actually touch the surface of the, of the neighboring cell. And then there are additional receptors that sense the small uh, signaling molecules that are sent out by the neighbors and by other systems, like hormonal systems. And so you, may, you might think of these signaling pathways as an amalgam of perhaps in any one cell, hundreds of, of signals coming in simultaneously 
to the cell. And for probably half a century, we've known something about how those signals talk to <laughs> the inner parts of the cell, but we have not known until uh, the last few years that many of the critical signaling pathways that are engaged in cancer actually go right to the oncogene control room and, and physically interact and talk then to the genes that are controlling cell identity. So we, for the first time, we actually have a link between uh, the, the pathways, their endpoints, and they're, they're in many cases just coming right to those genes that control cell identity and in a tumor cell are controlling its oncogenic identity. And that affects the circuitry because the um, uh, it's coming right to those genes that are running the show in the control room. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a couple questions related to maybe the specificity of these small molecules that you're discovering. And by that, I, I, I think it's like maybe three things. One is, first of all, even if it works, how do you know it's not causing a side effect that this small molecule is maybe harming normal cells? Then my second question related to that, if it's so specific that I only have that mutation and nobody else, who's gonna spend a billion dollars to come up with a drug that only I can take? Yeah, so this is very important. These, these two questions really are, <laughs> are fundamental to all of us who are interested in trying to solve these problems. So in the specificity issue, one of the things that's really challenging here is tumor cells are typically um, reactivating pathways that are embryonic, that you know, were operative in the, your earliest developmental steps and that should be off. And, uh, and so there, the tumor cells are finding various devious ways of turning them back on. And so a tumor cell becomes like a very early developing cell. It's dividing rapidly, it's, it's creating a mass, and that mass ultimately is what will kill you. So the tumor cell is often using the same apparatus that normal cells use. So that's why that first question is so profoundly important. What we've, what we've come to realize is despite the fact that many of these oncogenes are genes that have, you know, have proteins that are operative in normal cells, they're being so misregulated that they're creating a kind of house of cards for the tumor cell that we had not appreciated. And so now, so now in some instances, we can try and drug a protein that's really an abnormal protein and that normal cells don't have. That would be ideal. That is what Gleevec attempts to do uh, with a BCR-able fusion that's not in a normal cell. But in most cancer cells, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with a misregulated signaling pathway, a misregulated circuitry that we've discovered, um, what we discovered in 2013, is often associated with a, a, this thing we call a super enhancer that is, is often a, a, a site of gene control in the tumor cell that has usurped a tremendous amount of gene control apparatus and surprisingly to us also makes it extremely vulnerable. But because there's so much apparatus there, we don't know what specifically to target until we use David's screen to figure out among the hundreds or thousands of proteins involved in that abnormal house of cards, which ones are best to knock it down. So, so then your, your other question is, um, you know, what, what would cause someone to invest, you know, a billion dollars in, in these, these types of compounds? And what's happening is that academics have been developing small molecules by the processes that I just described now for a number of years, maybe the last three or four years. And uh, in the process, they've engendered, certainly in the Boston area, um, a group of venture capitalists who've come and who very quickly start companies that are just focused 
on paying for a phase one trial. So they generate this very rapid model, a commercial model, that takes a license to the initial technology and brings it into a setting where some talented people can test whether or not this is going to be safe in an individual. And then um, if that passes those phase one trials, often before that trial ends, uh, a, a larger company comes along and scoops them up. And that's, so that's what I mean by accelerating. I, there's a model in place that actually already works that is quite powerful for accelerating the movement of these chemistries into drugs, into uh, the clinic. David, I don't know if you want to add. I think, I think David wanted to say. No. Oh, no, no, I think the, the only thing I would add is that um, if you remember that comparison I showed between two types of AMLs, there was quite a few dots on the sides that I said were the types of genes we care about. And a lot of those, like you said, are, are completely personal to that single AML from that person. And you're probably right, it's gonna be quite challenging to in, induce a company to spend a lot amount of money to target that very personal mutation. But luckily there's that intermediate space, and I showed you one example of that RAF1 gene. If you have a KRAS mutation, which 25% of cancers about do, epithelial cancers, that gene matters. So that, that's a, a large number at that point. So there is a, there's really a gradation between those hyper-personal mutations that probably no one is going to develop unless you're a billionaire and could afford to do that yourself, and the ones that then start to be in the really you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people that are carrying those mutations. So. Okay, and now a word from our sponsor. I, I uh, just wanted to ask you one thing because I wanted to make sure that what I heard is really what you meant. It seems to me that we may have come full circle, albeit on a much higher level, that when cancer research first started decades ago, that the scientific community thought it was one disease, the big war on cancer, let's find the one thing that's behind it all. And then we learned that cancer is many things, very heterogeneous, and we had to study all of these many, many different things. But it seems to me that what you're saying now, that we may be back to a unified theory, something that stands behind it all, Mechanistically, I mean? Yes. I, I, think, I think the answer is yes, but it's slightly more complicated. I think we want to know all of this rich detail uh, because, you know, a, as a pilot, I, I know that the key to your safety is redundancy. There isn't a system on an aircraft that doesn't have a backup system, and that's why it is safer to go and fly you know, a major US carrier than it is to get out of bed in the morning. And cancer cells also have these redundancies. But as David's pointing out, we are converging on this idea for which we have evidence that in many cancers, there are going to be targets that uh, that are very disruptive to those tumor cells across a broad spectrum of tumor types. I, I, you know, an example is something I'm very excited about, uh, inhibition of cyclin-dependent kinases that seem to be a vulnerability in many very aggressive tumor cells. And 